really enthused about doing this, so uh, please give a warm welcome to Andrea Mancuso. Thank you, John, and hi, everybody. Um, I do actually want to start by saying uh, thank you to John Massier, curator here at Hall Walls, for developing this series and for the invitation to talk, and to Barbara Baird for suggesting that we bring Adam Zieglis to Nichols School. Um, hi, as John already mentioned, I'm Andrea Mancuso. I'm an artist, also known as Code, which is an ongoing collaboration that I established with Peter Doria in 1987. I'm also a curator, a writer, and a teacher at Nichols School, and I hope to tell you some things about Adam Zieglis, who's in the room. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay. Though each of us are more than the sum of our deeds, I'll begin there for the sake of introductions with Adam Zieglis' journalism bio, so you get a sense of the depth and breadth of his work as a journalist. In 2004, at just 22 years old, Zieglis became the staff cartoonist for the Buffalo News. Since then, his cartoons have been syndicated through cable cartoons, and they've appeared in magazines, books, and newspapers around the world, including the Washington Post, USA Today, Newsweek, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times. In 2013, he won the Clifford K. and James T. Berryman Award, given by the National Press Foundation. His work earned him a National Headliner Award for editorial cartoons in 2007, 2011, and 2015. Additionally, in 2015, he won the Graham's Aronson Cartooning with a Conscience Award and the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartoons. Last year, he was the president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists and was awarded the Sigma Delta Chi Award by the Society of Professional Journalists. So, that's his bio. Um, for myself, like many Buffalonians that grew up in the 70s and early 80s, the weekend was punctuated with a present in the form of an often soggy bundle of papers plopped on the kitchen table. The Sunday morning Buffalo Courier Express was covered in funnies that transformed the paper into a gift wrapped in colorful paper, a type of present of information from outside a retelling of the events of the week in art, sports, politics, international news, the weather, pictures, opinion, advice, and of course, advertisements. The Sunday paper was an institution, and the funnies announced its arrival with aplomb. To this day, my family recycles the newspaper as wrapping paper, selecting an appropriate section or article for each person for whom we're wrapping their gift. Last Christmas, this tradition helped me passively relieve my aggression towards friends and family members with differing political views. <laughs> I could select a section of the paper of specific events to be included in the wrapping. For particularly dear ones, we just ordered them a subscription to the New York Times. <laughs> I mean, we really love these people, and uh, even though we kind of think they're out of their minds. But <laughs> growing up in Buffalo, New York, we've been gifted a tradition of the best editorial cartooning in the country. These cartoons have been published by our local papers since at least the early 1900s. And reaching back to the mid-1950s, we've been treated to a legacy of extremely talented visual editorials by many illustrators, including three Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonists, Bruce Shanks, Tom Tolles, and Adam Zieglis. Considering that some major papers of record, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journals, have never employed an editorial cartoonist, we at Buffalo have a unique tradition in shaping the voice of what political cartooning is and what it can do. Bruce Shanks worked at the Buffalo Evening News from 1933 until his retirement in 1974, and he won a Pulitzer in 1958 for an image that criticized corrupt labor leaders by depicting a rank-and-file union member contemplating the news of, of this corruption as the thinker, a reference to Rodin's famous sculpture. Shanks was made an editorial cartoonist for the news finally in 1961. I'll switch. One of my favorites. Um, Tom Toll started off at the Buffalo Courier Express working there for nine years and then worked at the Buffalo News for 19 years. 
He is a celebrated cartoonist and included in his many credits, he has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in editorial cartooning in 1985. And in 1996, he won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, oh no, sorry, he was a finalist in 85 and 96, and he won the Pulitzer uh, in editorial cartooning in 1990. As exemplified by his, his cartoon, First Amendment, this cartoon points um, to the debate around free speech a theme for tonight, really, and the Flag Protections Act. Tom's, um, Toll's First Amendment cartoon is annotated with a list of conditions that consume and extend beyond the picture frame. When Tolls left Buffalo in 2002 for the Washington Post, it was to fill the vacant position left by the death of cartooning legend Herbert Block, also known as Herb Block. It was at this time that Adam Ziegler, a recent Canisius College graduate, was brought onto the news as an intern and was quickly hired full time. In Don Metz's Tribute to Tolls, published by the Birchfield Penny Art Gallery, Ziegler is quoted remarking about his experience growing up reading Tom Toll's cartoons in the daily paper. Ziegler commented on Toll's accomplishment of having an aesthetic voice in his cartoons. Referring to Toll, Ziegler said, I'm definitely thinking about how to stand out on my own like he does. Ziegler recalled this experience being hired as a replacement for Tom Toll's shoes, which were looming above him, placing Ziegler under high pressure. With, with a certain generation, Tom Toll's is their car cartoonist, Ziegler remarked. I knew the gravity of the seat, he said, understanding the history of the cartooning tradition in Buffalo. Ziegler adds, because of the success of Buffalo editorial cartoonists, the position is strong and allowed editors to honor the position. Ziegler recalled the conversations he had with people that he worked with and met, as literally everyone greeted him at the news and beyond with the cautionary encouragement that he had big shoes to fill. One can imagine the pressure a 22-year-old Ziegler felt a recent computer science and math graduate from Canisius College, working on the news floor, feeling the heat focused on him by the magnifying glass of opinion. If you haven't visited the Buffalo <coughs> News, I should point out that architecturally, it's housed in this brutalist style building, built in 1973 by Edward Durrell Stone. The interior is true to form with open floor plans. The center is filled with desks and people working in full view of each other without partitions. Ziegler said he didn't mind working on the floor, but because his desk was located at an intersection, he would often be interrupted to talk with folks as they walked by. In the distance, Tom Toll's private office lay vacant with Toll's work desk, even to this day, at its entrance. Okay, there's the entrance. <laughs> And he finally got there, moving into Toll's office within a few years of working at the news. Um, I think this slide's interesting also because Bruce Shank's cartoons are um, uh, framing the door, the doorway there. Um, anyway, at that particular office, Adam's office, Toll's old office, has been occupied by a cartoonist at the news for decades. It has a big window with the view and a large overhead fluorescent light humming away. Right now, like literally right now, the light is on. In fact, it doesn't even have a switch. The light stays on all the time, all the time. If you drive by the news tonight, you should look over. You can see it, the office with the one light that never goes out. It's an ominous portent located in the middle of our city with a slight view of the lake, a satirical eternal flame of glowing mercury vapor shining over the regrowth of downtown, and perhaps subtly adding a touch of more madness to the generations of Buffalo cartoonists. So I wanted to get a picture of the office with the light on, and I just didn't get to it. But, I, but instead, I thought I would show you a slide of what it would look like if the light ever went out. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, one week, five cartoons, four deadlines. Over the course of a regular week, Adam Ziegler produces five cartoons. The deadlines are, I believe, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and two due on Thursday. Ziegler's cartoons appear in the Buffalo paper Monday through Thursday and on, on Sunday. 
When I interviewed Adam, I was interested in exploring his studio practice, the methods he uses to stay informed and develop ideas for his cartoons. As a practicing artist, I know that the work is continuous. That's why people aptly refer to an artist's work as a practice, because a practice is something you do on a consistent basis, presumably because you never quite get good enough. <laughs> Creative ideas often become apparent apparent in unlikely places, such as outside of the studio, in fleeting moments when the mind is occupied with other tasks, such as this one captured the day before Halloween. Oh wait, sorry, you will get to it. This is just, there it is. <laughs> so um, I wanted to show sort of a week's worth of his work. Uh, this is from last week, mostly. So this is a uh, trick or treat. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> distraction in the form of unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> uh, this was from Tuesday, uh, Halloween, October 31st. Um, Manafort's disguise, an unmasking of Manafort as a uh, Russian bear. Um, and then there's this one. It's a taking the lid off of our sheriff, who's still our sheriff, Tim Howard. And then, and then this image from November 3rd, um, you know, of, of self-reflective ponderings for uh, journalists. Okay, now there's, the, there's this desk. There's Adam at his desk. I learned that Zieglis has a very organized work ethic. The mornings are spent looking over news sources, researching the news of the day. He takes notes, listing ideas for possible cartoons and different types of communication strategies. The afternoon is for pencil sketching and drafting out some of his ideas onto eight and a half by 11 inch paper, adding to the piles of ideas that he has on his desk at the news. Once he has a few ideas, Zieglis consults an inner circle of folks at the news, people whose opinion he trusts, and uses this work in progress, to, this sort of work in progress critique to narrow his decision. When his choices are between a few ideas, then Zieglis consults with his editor and settles on one design to execute in pen, adding color digitally only after the work is scanned. Here are some piles ideas and spare ideas, ideas sorted. Um, another group of piles. I think I have a close up on the next one of, I think there's some that are unpublished in here, I'm not sure, but um, I'm gonna speculate because I haven't seen the, the middle image, which is not that obvious, which is of the sort of Facebook logo, the, that F transforming in a series which is a, a trope of his that we'll see in a couple of other images into the hammer and sickle. And then in the lower right-hand corner, there's another uh, particularly interesting image of a, um, I don't know if it's, it's a camera, like a media camera, or a cameraman looking in a mirror faced with a camera. So. Oh, and then this is interesting also. I thought this is his lamp, and on there, it's, uh, it's covered with these stickers that he designs for the Buffalo Newspaper Guild, which is the largest union at the Buffalo News. And it's affiliated uh, with the Newspaper Guild, which is part of the Communications Workers of America. So, he does a lot of work, a lot of design work for them also. Okay, so here, this is Adam at his home office. It's really neat. I don't think it's normally that neat. I think he cleaned up for us. He knew I was gonna come and take some photographs. Um, but, and although Adam is published by the Buffalo News and they do hold exclusive rights for publishing in Buffalo, he's a syndicated cartoonist, which means that his work is available for publishing um, through Kegel Cartoons and uh, Cargill's political cartoon store uh, for other markets. And I thought it was interesting to see the prices of some of his um, 
cartoons is determined by the context and the publication audience, where it's like f for, from $5 for education to $300 if you were gonna use it in a featured film. Um, here's this collection of Micron pens. <laughs> nice details. And then uh, this is on the bulletin board at his house, this um, like homage to the best of Adam Ziegler's of 2016. Okay, so homegrown. When John Massier asked me to talk about a Buffalo artist, I immediately came up with a list of people that I'd like to spend some time writing about. However, as we reviewed the list, some we took off because they no longer live in Buffalo. Well, we know they'll be back. And others I thought might be obvious choices for the way they've influenced my work as an artist. Adam Ziegler was a bit of a mystery to me. I knew his work. We had met and talked about art. And for the past two years, my good friend, artist and curator Barbara Baird and I had been working to have an, ex an exhibition of Ziegler's work at Nichols School. Um, I'm going to talk about the Nichols show at the end, but credit really has to be given to Barbara for highlighting the significance of Adam's work in, to Buffalo, to our experience of the current political world, and the importance of free speech, and especially individuals that are working to keep it nimble, healthy, responsive, despite real pressure to hide away and stay silent. In some ways, Ziegler has inspired a post-election Instagram project that Viracode is currently working on. And for many, myself included, Ziegler has helped me get through this year with his smart, clear, and captivating cartoons that have gotten me to laugh about the scary times we're in right now. I am a regular reader of Ziegler's cartoons, serial cartoons. And I look forward to the sketches he posts on Instagram as tomorrow's lines. You can get a preview of what's coming up the next day and, uh, and then see the full color cartoon the next day. So I, of course, checked it this afternoon. Really, it's a really nice one coming up. And we can talk about it a little bit later on. So um, he also mentioned, I think this is interesting, this use of uh, social media and the way that, I mean, that's a whole other talk that's not this talk that I would love to talk to anyone about at some point, how that's sort of changing the way that we are um, experiencing the world. But um, he uses it to timestamp the image, which is kind of interesting to sort of, uh, yeah, so that that's the time, that's the date and time that he uh, came up with or completed that image. Oh, at his house also, I had to take a photograph of the Pulitzer Trophy. <laughs> when Adam won the Pulitzer Prize in 2015, the committee made their decision by looking at 10 of his cartoons submitted by editor and vice president of the news, Mike Connolly. The Pulitzer Committee said in his citation, awarded to Adam Ziegler of the Buffalo News, who's who used strong images to connect with readers while conveying layers of meaning in a few words. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about as we look at some of those uh, cartoons. Third, um, I mean, like this one, with really, no, very, very little text and such a strong graphic element. This is, these are from 2014, these images. Or this one, which uses the sense of sequence, which he, he does often, but you know, it's really effective. No, very, very few words repeated. Or this one, one of my favorites. Um, again, this, <laughs> it, 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 you know, yes, I should hang this up on a wall in a frame, not my first dollar bill or whatever. But anyway, this, this use of, uh, Irony in his work is really present, and um, and also the figure and this sort of uh, history he has with drawing caricatures, which we can talk about a little bit more. All right, I'm gonna, so as an honors student at Canisius College, Ziegler chose to write his thesis, which is a requirement for that program. Um, and remember, he's a computer science math major. He chose to write his thesis on the art of editorial cartooning. In this thesis, Ziegler connects the principles of good editorial cartooning to the definitions of art. He questions whether art editorial cartooning is primarily an art form, and then answer that, answers that question with an emphatic yes. He proposes a system for evaluating cartoons, 
maybe that's the computer science side. Um, linking conceptual art and cartooning. Zieglis writes, this central dimension is the concept or idea behind the cartoon, which corresponds to what I call the conceptual art dimension. The, this, this concept is the third universal element in all artworks, and it is an extremely important part of the editorial cartoon. The concept is the way that a, the way that a work of art says what it says, he writes. The domineering power of the conceptual art dimension is the primary force between an editorial cartoon's effectiveness. So Zieglis's college thesis lays out these three principles, which in some ways differs from what many cartoonists talk about in terms of really just two principles. And for Zieglis, they're the form, the quality of the drawing, the quality of the graphic art, the message, and the concept or the idea of the cartoon. And we can apply these rubrics to his award-winning works and really all of his works. Oh, there's the thesis. It's available online, Adam. I don't know if you know that, but. <laughs> so yeah, so I read it. And, uh, <laughs> and it's great. It's really, it's really surprising. And, um, yeah. and I, well, I will just keep going. So <laughs> um, this is, he, he also sent me some of his illustrations. So I'm gonna show you two illustrations that I think are just really, really strong examples of his uh, use of those three principles, right? This, this trope of the hourglass, the idea of aid, um, and, and of course the execution of this in terms of the way that he's able to sort of communicate all those ideas visually. Um, the cartoon that's coming out tomorrow reminds me of this one because he's repeating the same idea with bullets and, um, and you have like uh, thoughts and prayers, I think are the, is the text in there. And then uh, the figure that's wearing a patriotic hat is sort of being drowned by these empty uh, bullet shells, I think. So really interesting. Uh, and then there's also this illustration he sent, which again, I think is graphically just so dynamic and exciting and um, you know this, the morphing of the uh, continent of Africa and the gun and, with Mali as the trigger. Oh, I had to take a picture of his books. Um, the Naked Cartoonist, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and then uh, back to one of the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, cartoons such a strong use of caricature in this one. And of course, balance, and again, very little words. Here is one from that on global warming. So the thought bubble, how could he, just, how could he go it alone just to pursue an agenda? <laughs> Looming on the other half of the frame is the scientific community. And then, uh, and this is another one that and again, global warming, but told a very different way through this sort of sequence. If the Earth is round, then explain this. If gravity is real, then explain that. If evolution is real, then explain this. If global warming is real, then explain that, pointing to a snowflake. And uh, this one, which has such strong visual balance and sort of asymmetry. <laughs> Really exciting. Okay, so Adam's first college class at Canisius was with English teacher Tom Joyce, um, and apparently in this class, Joyce conducted Joyce, who ended up becoming really close with Adam and was one of his thesis advisors. Joyce conducted this cheesy icebreaker in the class, asking students to state their name, their major, and some information about themselves. And Zieglis, who's starting college now, is a you know again. Um, computer program and math major choose to mention, chose to mention that he likes to draw and that he worked at Darien Lake drawing car caricatures in the summer. So Joyce, being a, uh, clearly a very smart teacher, asked Adam uh, to join the Griffin, which was the school's newspaper that uh, Joyce oversaw with Mel Schroeder, I believe, and, and they both also helped him in the end with his thesis. Um, as a cartoonist, Zieglis started a weekly cartoon called Zig that depicted his experiences as a student. So I found one. 
This one's great. This is near and dear to me as a teacher at a school. We have the English teacher on the left who is calling IT, clearly, because he has a smart board and a computer or something, and it, there's, it's no signal. And then I think the figure on the right is a computer science teacher who's drawn with the dry erase markers, um, an image, and he says, um, and this is what we would see if we had a computer. <laughs> Um, oh, I was going to leave this for a minute. Okay, um, Zig expressed Adam's opinion about things around campus, and also, and often featured his friends, fellow Griffin staff, his teachers, and even his girlfriend, now wife Jessica. I think that it was that time that he spent drawing caricatures, that experience of drawing someone on the spot, working from life with his subject and audience, right there in one person in front of him, fast on his feet, that's key, it's a key factor that singles out Ziegler's work. Um, when doing research for his drawings, he told me that he prefers to meet the people in person so that he can uh, watch them move and see if they're graceful or clumsy. And if he can't meet them, he often does research using photographs, but also really prefers to watch videos of them talking and interacting with other people. Um, when Ziegler was growing up, he mentioned that his father was very much into politics, but it was really after 9-11 and the U.S. invasion of Iraq, which really greatly affected Ziegler, that he started to make political cartoons. And as a sophomore at Canisius College, Ziegler received a National College Cartooning Award and convinced the dean of Canisius College to pay for him to go to, this, to the annual American Association of Editorial Cartoonists Conference in Lexington, Kentucky. There, it was there that Ziegler connected to editorial cartooning, that the community, and first considered cartooning as a career. Here's some more from that, um, the Pulitzer portfolio. Again, this this simple but is but like strong use of this idea of before and after. Where usually we see an improvement. <laughs> Um, Russian nesting dolls with Stalin lurking within Putin. Um, you know, the use of language is not, uh, is, is so restrained in some ways, and this just is a restrained use of a pun, which is another trope that he um, uses quite a lot. Um, here is a uh, former Speaker of the House, is again, I think the strength of this one and many of them, again, is, is the, uh, the drawing of the face, this ability to really express who this is. If you don't know who the figure is and you think you might know who it is, it's, it's really easy to connect his work to the people based on um, looking at their photographs. Or you think you might know and then, as I did for many, many of these, and I think this is John Boehner, I believe, and, um, this is also from that early portfolio. And I think this is Senator Saxby Chambliss from Georgia, who defended the use of torture as an effective means. Um, I think it is. I don't know. He'll correct. We, he, he, um, Adam will answer some questions afterwards so we can save those. <laughs> These are a couple more. Um, this is, again, this comparison within context about net neutrality. It's so equal. And then, um, and then this one. I love the repetition of the shape, the hand, the finger pointing, and then of course the gun. Um, and this is said because that's a real place. I didn't make that up. Burgers and Bullets is where really? that little girl was killed. Oh, really? Or oh. that where she killed uh, the trainer by, by shooting an Uzi. So uh, I didn't make that up. I made the logo up. The logo. So that's how the, it is. Oh, that's, yeah, that's awful. <laughs> well, we can ask him more about those figures. <coughs> um, and again, here is this comparison. And again, this use of pun. <coughs> and then this one. Adam mentioned that 
you know, and this is something I'm going to talk about in a minute, is in terms of his relationship to his audience and the feedback that he gets for his cartoons and the dialogue and conversations that he that he has with people when they, because, you know, we have, this is all part of our world, we have strong reactions to these. And he mentioned a woman that had a really negative reaction to this work, but talked to him for a while, and the conclusion really was that she had, had really identified with this work because she was herself very depressed and felt like this was an accurate uh, depiction of what that experience was like, or is like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, about net neutrality, I think. Okay. All right. Well, in photographing Adam at his office, I was really curious about the cartoons, notes, and ephemera that hung and was around the room. And uh, I didn't spend that much time there, but I took a bunch of photographs. And it wasn't really till afterwards when I was looking closely at the photographs, doing my sort of like blade runner, zooming in to see, wait, what, what is really on the wall here? That I noticed that there are lots of letters hung up on the wall. And, um, and so here, this is one of the walls in the, in, the news, in the Buffalo News office. And there's the headliners awards are hanging on the wall. And then there's these letters. Um, these letters are, are have a the cartoon is in the, is on the stationery, per, perhaps just cut out of the paper with a note from a reader underneath them, and um, often often the letters are really positive, you know, commending him on these on this tr the um, on the illustration or on the idea or the message. There's one of these um, is really interesting. There's like. Often he'll get, I noticed, I, we can maybe ask more about this, but he'll get suggestions on things that he could add or change in the future to make his cartoons more effective. And there, this one letter on the, road, on the right um, had a suggestion and then said, um, you know, may I add to this addition, but it's, you know, absolutely no credit is desired. That's what the, uh, <laughs> that was added on the letter. Um, so, Okay, so anyway, I think that this relationship to the work and to the way his work is, the way people respond to his work is true to the spirit of free speech. He has letters from fans and critics, and he sees that his work is open to interpretation, and he uses their interpretation as part of, of, part of the insight. I mean, some of them are really difficult and rough, and it was surprising to me that he has these right in front of him when he's working, so every day, sort of this wall is filled with them. And I believe from what I can see on these, some of them there's things added or, or there's white out, there's notes. Um, one of them, the cartoon that's on the uh, stationary, it's, not, it's on the um, sort of loose leaf sheet of paper. It's that uh, global warming cartoon with the scientific community on the right has sort of written out on the top, you know, why don't you tell the truth in place of these politically correct lies? That's just front and center. So um, that's just an interesting um, connection to the diversity of uh, views. So, oh, that's like zooming in a little. <laughs> All right. Oh, and there I noticed there's even a new, another letter was unopened on, a, on this pile there at, at the desk, at one of the desks in his office. I thought I would show this one. Uh, Adam shared this with me, and um, if you had seen it in the paper, it did get a lot of strong responses. So um, this is a, a strong cartoon. You can read it on Guantanamo Bay detention camp. And then um, this is... This is a, a letter he received about uh, that cartoon, someone who you know, had a big objection with it. And then uh, this, is a, this is the letter that Adam wrote back. 
<laughs> oh. and, uh, and then this is another letter, and they're really threatening, and they're so difficult. It's really, it's, it's uh, admirable work to be, you can just imagine put what he's doing, putting, him, putting himself out there every day, right? Um, and I will, uh, I would want to show you another sequence, another, another cartoon that was really important to him, which is this one. Um, and this, yeah. So this one is from 2007, and this is referring to the bike path rapist. And, oh, this was on his computer screen, but I have a better image, right? And so, it really, this image gives view of the facts of the case. Although it does also imply that the Buffalo Police Department made oversights in the case. Um, and when this cartoon was published, Zeglis was called by the chief of police and asked to apologize. Um, in addition, he received threatening phone calls at his home from the police saying they would not help him if he called 9-11. Um, and despite all of, all of this, um, Adam, I think, is really proud of this cartoon because it did cause some pressure on the police force that resulted in questioning regarding the handling of this case. Um, and he, you know, this is from another article he wrote, that this is one time I can say a cartoon was really instrumental in moving the needle on a local level. And so this case greatly affected his belief in the power of dialogue and cartoons in opening up this public debate. <coughs> And then um, this is a this this message is in response to that cartoon also. So I know that I've been talking for quite a oh not terrible but quite a long time. I have a couple more that I want to show you, and then I'm gonna and then of course hopefully we could have some questions, um, and maybe Adam will answer some of them too, or he might have something you might have something you want to add. I'm not sure. So. Um, you know, I will have to just phrase, I, I do feel like I have to mention this in which we, uh, meant, you know, we're all pretty familiar with, is this event that took place in 2005 when far, five cartoonists that worked for the Charlie Hebdo magazine in France were killed for, the, for, for their drawings. Um, and those were a series of images, and they had a tradition of doing images of religious leaders, but also of Muslims in unflattering ways, and of the Prophet Muhammad. And they, you know, maybe they were pushing the envelope there in terms of ridiculing Muslims, and it stirred a lot of controversy, and it caused this horrific reaction. Um, but it is interesting that this case certainly did raise awareness to this particular issue, and. Um, their readership really grew after that, which is interesting. But I think that in terms of what the lines are for free speech, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting and complicated question. You know, I think we're facing that. We face that all the time. What are one's personal limits? Um, Adam's interested in free speech and the complications it brings out, and of course the need for discourse. So. Um, he says, this is another quote I had, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Um, and that it's up to the public, it's, it's, up to, it's the public's role to respond and engage in this dialogue, but the government should, should not intervene. Ziegler says, as a political cartoonist, my responsibility is to ignite some kind of discussion. Um, and so cartooning is a form of free speech. Uh, I thought I would just put these two organizations up here that he's worked closely with. I mentioned earlier that he was the president of the um, AAEC, which is, um, um, and he was the president last year. And this, um, this organization does a lot of really interesting things in terms of promoting the interests of staff, freelance, and student editorial cartoonists in the United States. And this organization has really close ties with another organization that he's involved in called the uh, Cartoonist Rights Network International. And this organization goes to places or works with place, 
people in different places of the world. It helps car particularly cartoonists that are being persecuted. So this is the site just from yesterday. And so on the site, there's information about this Malaysian cartoonist, Zunar, who's been receiving threats from his supporters. And this organization is working to help him. Um, this is a cartoonist who's received the Courage and Editorial Cartooning Award and the Cartooning for Peace Award, and he's being persecuted. So um, it's just the sort of the depth and breadth of his interest in this is really um, genuine. Okay. Oh, I was going to show some of these. He sent me also these unpublished cartoons. I thought these would be an interesting collection of things to show. I don't really know that much about them. You can ask him, but um, they these were unpublished. And, and maybe when you see them, you're like, oh, of course, that's maybe a little bit too much uh, for the editorial board. So. <laughs> we got some. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, I have, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I think this this is an this this little series is an interesting one of trying to convey <laughs> the Cosby case. Yeah. Um, so this one wasn't published, but the next two were published, and so they have they have the same um, kind of the same message, but there's different context and form. There's this one. Classic trope of the wolf in sheep's clothing. And this one. <laughs> statue, yeah, you can read that statue of limitations. Um, so I thought this quote was interesting, and then I'm going to show you some of the Nichols' work. Um, and then wrap up. But uh, Rich, Rich McKee, who's a staff cartoonist with the Augusta Chronicle, wrote, find me a pro-Trump ca pro cartoonist, a real editorial cartoonist that is not pro-anything. Editorial cartooning is a negative act. You may be supportive of a certain point of view, but it's criticism. You don't want to be a cheerleader for any particular position. Um, So um, this is in the this is in the Flickinger Gallery at Nichols School. This is the show drawing a reaction, the editorial work of Adam Zieglis. and he did a couple really interesting things in the show. He has a series of images that show his sketches, and then the uh, black and white image, and then the colored image, so that you can see the process. Uh, it's really interesting to see the way that he uses the pencil sketches and um, tries to maintain sort of the looseness and the line in the pencil sketches in the final, um, in the pen sketches and the final work, so that gesture is really important to him. Um, there's a wall of these uh, book covers. Um, this is, I have close-ups of them, so you can see sort of, again, really, really strong work in terms of the way he's able to display the figure and these presidents. This is, we call this the president's wall. Can you identify everyone? Who's the guy with Teddy? Who's the guy with Teddy? Yeah. That, is it Taft? Taft. Yes. <laughs> and this one, do you want to guess who that is? LBJ. And then these guys. <laughs> and then all of them together. <laughs> Um, what was really unique about this experience of the show, this is a wall that has a lot of, of cartoons that are about Buffalo. And then there's this large piece that's like the midway at the fair. There's a black and white version and then that image. I have a the one that's not that scene I can show you. I have a little bigger one of this color image. But again, we, we're used to seeing these images like one at a time. And 
the unique thing about this show um, in and really the unique thing for me in putting this talk together was being able to sort of look at them all together and sort of see the strength of this portfolio. It always, in fact, really does have a strong aesthetic voice. Um, here's, these are a couple more from the show. <laughs> and, oh, this is just a, Adam talking to the school. Oh, and I was gonna, I was going to read a little bit, end with reading a little bit of his uh, artist statement and sort of go through the, a series of images that are in the show at Nichols. So, all right. <laughs> Editorial cartoons have long occupied a unique and important place in America. In a country that prides itself in constitutional freedoms, <laughs> These vehicles of visual satire hold the line on free expression. <laughs> the ability of a visual satirist to freely take aim at corruption and abuse of power is a direct gauge of a country's democracy. The rise of authoritarianism around the world is, provo is proving this true, as cartoonists in Turkey, Iran, Egypt, and Malaysia have experienced oppression. Boss Tweed's famous—I <laughs> know we just not this one. <laughs> Boss Tweed's famous retort of "Stop them damn pictures." That's actually the quote that's on his thesis. My constituents don't know how to read, but they can't help seeing them damn pictures. Um, could have been uttered by dictators around the world today. Here in America, the recent rise of Donald Trump <laughs> has created a real and serious threat to American journalism, including the nation's cartoonists. It is more important now, perhaps more than ever before, to support strong and biting visual satire during this time of political turbulence. So, well, that's one of the pencil sketches. Just have a few more images here to end. <laughs> this one's really lovely too, visually. This is worth reading, so I'll leave it here for a minute. And that's a quote by John Adams. Um, <coughs> <laughs> really smart. <laughs> oh, and then and then we'll end with some of the buffalo ones that are just lovely. Okay. Yep. <laughs> A lot of people are working hard on this. <laughs> and then this one of Carl Palladino. A lot of people worked hard for this. <laughs> and. Uh, Probably everyone's favorite, really. Um, this was a highlight of the show. It's a, just a great message and image. And, uh, and here we are, back at, at the beginning or at the end. So anyway, well, thank you. That's what I have. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe if you have some questions and you can chime in if you want to, you don't have to come up here, but um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Adam or for me. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One is very simple. Um, there was a picture of a mustachioed man on his office wall that looked like Leon Trotsky. Mm -hmm. Was it? Joseph Bolt. Is that yeah, I actually had that. Um, I had that on the wall like years before the Pulitzer because I had uh, a book page assignment. All the caricatures I used to draw um, a book page, a caricature, portrait caricature of the subject of a, a book review um, for the week book review on Sunday stage. I was I would do it almost every week, and then it became infrequent. But one was a book on just the Pulitzer. I think I did two over the course of ten years. But I had. Over time, I had different photos of my subjects on the wall that I had taken down, and I just thought I would keep him on the wall in the spirit of, you know, like Chris Drury putting the Stanley Cup on the Sabres locker room kind of thing as a reminder of what the standard should be. So I just kind of kept it there. My second question is, 
more difficult one. Um, would you draw Mohammed and publish it? It's hard to give a yes or no because it all depends on the context. I think if the point you're trying to make warrants it, I've never gotten to a situation where I thought I, I needed to depict visually Muhammad other than maybe his arm or something. Um, and where I thought, you know, maybe it would, it would help the point. Um, in my past, those when that's come up, I thought to myself, this would just cause problems for the wrong reason. It wouldn't, it wouldn't strengthen, get attention to my message. It would create an alternate controversy. Um, so I think a lot of what, when cartoonists were drawing Muhammad, not, I'm not speaking for every cartoonist, but it was often done for controversy's sake, uh, for the pure sake of free speech, and there's no other message other than that. And I think that they're totally fair in doing that because I believe in absolute free speech and in democracy. Um, I think there's fair, they're fair to get criticism, knowing the history of why their the cultures don't depict Muhammad or they do in certain ways and don't depict other prophets like Jesus or Moses. And I researched the, the history of why they don't do that, and I, I you know, I respect that. Um, but I don't respect the the the, the, rad, you know, the extreme people who um, take that too far and punish. Uh, Free, people who practice free speech. What about the so I, I might in the future? What about fear of physical harm coming to you? Does that play into the factor of not doing it? It never did. After obviously Charlie Hebdo, we've had talks with you know we were in close in the community, cartoonists, um, even globally, but specifically in America, and we never overseas cartoonists have gotten um, you know well before Charlie Hebdo, they've gotten physically harmed and killed. Um, uh, and at that point, because France is so, we see that as so Western and so American, um, it did make us, for, for a couple of months, you know, we were all like calling each other, and we knew I met a couple of those cartoonists. I was in Paris uh, the October before the attacks, and I met um, Char and two of them at a cartoon for Peace event. And, you know, they're really just wonderful people. Um, France is so unique, though, that it's, um, it's, it's, it's really the, the mecca for cartoonists. They have such a strong tradition, and there are so many cartoonists. Um, it's something like Charlie Hebdo, I don't think they can be successful here in terms of this thriving underground um, magazine. But they have sort of a different, they're also at a cultural crossroads, you know, geographically. So I feel like cartoonists, and I'm not less worried about that. I'm, you know, I think the worry we've had in America is just any random you know, angry right-wing um, reader, uh, I think is more of a realistic threat to me than ISIS, you know, so good point. Thanks. Yeah. You know, any other questions? What did you, so you grew up reading Buffalo News. What, I just figured it was an old cartoonist that was at the news, or a sick. Did you ever like him? For sick well, yeah. Page? Yeah. I never had to name uh, I think he, he started, he sort of faded away in terms of doing sports cartoons on a rare occasion and then he would do, he, I think he still did some freelance sports cartoons and then greeting cards and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, I think sports cartooning is such a, a, a you know, a lost art. Um, there used to be, a lot of papers would have two cartoonists or three and one of them was exclusively sports. Um, I, I, I don't know personally, so I haven't, not familiar with what, what he, if he's doing any work anymore, but I haven't seen his stuff. Which is Ralph Wilson with the healthy ears. Yeah, he had some, <laughs> had some great uh, sports cartoons. Um, what really sparked your interest for writing cartoons? Um, well, uh, it, at the Griffin at Canisius College, I think just starting to interact with uh, a readership, even as small as um, you know, at Canisius campus readership, I, I saw the sort of um, the impact that tr starting a conversation um, can have. And like as Andrea mentioned, 9-11 really sucked me into history and current events. I, I was always kind of interested in it. I think his, history teachers are so important in our, um, uh, you know, in our schools because it's so challenging. As a kid, I really didn't see the value of history until we went through it personally. And 9-11 was a big piece of history you looked through. So that after that, I was really just, it was, it was a passion and almost an obsession for a while, um, even though I kept computer science and math going. Um, 
and I think it, I've talked to other artists that in my similar age that had a you know, big impact on it as well. I think um, I think we, we had, I had one other question. I was just curious to ask you about because um, you've done quite a lot and notice and I notice even in you know it seems like you're very focused, right? So even right, like reading some of the thesis that you wrote, I mean, you, you even talk specifically about like the Pulitzer's assessment and criteria, and you use that as a as a background. You do this big research on art. You're clearly really interested in that, and so I guess I'm curious as to like, what's next. What would you do next? Uh, I mean, not that you're going to stop doing these cartoons, <laughs> and uh, but I'm just curious if there was an area that you're speculating on. Um, doing um, more. Yeah, no, I always, um, I always. Well, my wife and I would want to team up and do a children's book or or a couple. I think it would be great. We have two little kids and. I was I knew growing up from years ago that um, Dr. Seuss uh, was a political cartoonist and went after the Nazis viciously. So that's always fun to uh, inspire other cartoonists to go into children's books. It's a tough market, but it, it would just be fun. Mm -hmm. But I think um, beyond that, career-wise, uh, I would love to work with a journalist or a writer to to do some form of long form a long form piece, whether it's a graphic novel or um, comics journalism, which is a it's sort of an up and coming, like a very cool up and coming field in editorial cartooning. Um, also, really work with uh, other um, artists to possibly animate um, some of my work. Mm -hmm. But you know, all that is in the future. Oh, that's cool. I'll we'll look forward to that. Oh, yeah, one more. Um, this was talked about with uh, the talk show about how in the news cycle it's so difficult for them to have like the most current jokes written. Show. So how do you deal with that? Like, do you go home and then you see something and you're like, there, uh, oops. Yeah, it's real, well, it's, in this day and age, it's, I mean, I, I can count at least 10 times in the last eight months that I've literally just like ripped something up halfway through it because of something that's going on. Like, it just, it's like a 30 second news cycle, you know, that we're in. So it's, it's impossible. Um, and the, the struggle with cartooning and even, you know, it's not live, you know, you, um, you, you have to balance, you don't want to give the product away. Um, you know, the Buffalo News is, we go, we go back and forth on how much do you give away right away. You know, for me, something really, a big story happens, I want to publish it as soon as I draw it. And I can do that on occasion, but you know, on a regular basis, you have to wait, you know, almost 12 hours after you finish something. Um, so I think in the future, I mean, it would be cool to do some, whether it's with social media, I don't know if it's like, other kind of cartoonists have been this like live sketching, I haven't found it, it's kind of hit and miss, I haven't found it super engaging, but um, I, I think more just like being able to have sort of be okay with myself to release an unfinished sort of a lot more blocks, because I have honestly like a dozen a week often that I won't use. Like the amount of work that I use that I don't finish, I should, I, my editor was like, yeah, might, he's okay with me possibly in the future as news moves faster and faster possibly to, you know, publish some, you know, early rough, rough work. But it is, it's hard. Thank you, Bob. Oh, John. Hi, Anna. Hi. Um, just to follow up on that, and, you know, this is not for you to give away in your future uh, career motivations, but uh, Andrea alluded earlier to social media, and now you're talking about, like, that desire to, like, you know, I've got it done. I want to post it. I want to, you know, I want to get it out there. I mean, at the same time, I appreciate that you have, um, you know, you're embedded in the tradition of the newspaper cartoonist and a deep respect for that and that history. But do you foresee a, a point in the future where the platform changes, where you're no longer you know, associated with a paper, you're just Adam Ziglis, you know, with your platform in that new terrain 10 years from now that yeah. affords that immediacy uh, that, you know, you, you, where you don't have that 12 hour lag anymore. Right. I mean, I think in the back of my mind, um, ever since I was in college, I think, I, I think about Establishing my own brand as an artist, independent, 
And even when I joined the news, um, they wanted me to get rid of my website. And it was just, it's not a great website. Um, uh, I just threw it together myself, but just to have some the work up there. And I convinced them you know, that I can keep it because I want my URL. And I'll just start winking. I'll keep my archive up there, but I just will wink the current work to the Buffalo News they want traffic. But I was dead set on there's no way I'm giving this up. Like I'm not gonna, you know, this is my, as an artist, it's, it's my own work. I know that I'm given, you know, um, the platform and I'm very lucky and fortunate to have the Buffalo News and the tradition. But I think you have to think, like, you, you know, plan for anything. And, and there are a lot of cartoonists who are extremely successful and are more talented and, and experienced than I am that just have a paper that had financial struggles and they had to just self, you know, they became syndicated um, or they were syndicated and they just use that as a, as a platform to just create their own work. And, you know, and a lot of cartoonists are successful doing that. They can just be syndicated, they can work with other papers on a freelance basis, they can just like any other freelance illustrator um, and then, you know, do all kinds of work. So for now, uh, it's, there are very few positions that give the cartoonist as much support as the Buffalo News does. And I don't know if people, our readers know that. And I think we're lucky here. Um, um, there's probably 50 full-time staff editorial cartoonists in the country. 100 making a living out of it, maybe. Maybe 75 to 100. So 50 staff. And of the 50, a lot of them are under a lot of controls or not treated as well. So it's a unique field. Um, and I think the Buffalo News, like as Andrea mentioned, the success of Shanks and Tolls um, allowed the editors to respect the position. I think that was kind of key. Um, and I think other cartoonists that are in positions where they don't have a history or a legacy, they, they, the editors don't treat them the same way. The, does the New Yorker hire its cartoonists or they freelance? Freelance. Most cartoonists are freelance in general, and it's, it's the New Yorker's brutal. I mean, I know I have a few friends that are New Yorker cartoonists, and. They, they create so much for them. They will pay for a lot of work they don't even publish, and they'll, they'll create a lot of work that they don't get paid for. So I know like uh, my friend Tom Toro, he creates just, I think he created like 400 cartoons before he even got one accepted. And then, and then he's a regular contributor at this point, but he will you know frequently share cartoons that were, oh, they bought this, but they didn't print it. So, and it's, uh, they, they have a great tradition as well, and um, you know, I think, Hopefully, in the future, uh, we're in an age, I think, where satire in general, whether it's political or not, is totally valuable right now, mm -hmm. and people are just eating it up. Uh, so that, that's the silver lining to the age we're in, I think. Well, that's, that's a nice way to, to wrap up, I think, with the silver lining. <laughs> um, but again, I really want to thank you guys for coming out. And I'll, so thank Owls and John um, Nassie for putting this together. It's just exciting to have these kinds of conversations locally about all the great art that we have in our city. So, thanks. thanks.